sing to the Lord, preparing our hearts uh, to hear the preaching of God's word this evening. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him no other, my soul is satisfied in him alone. As summer flowers we fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal calls to us at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might, or human wisdom's fleeting light. But I will boast in knowing Christ at the I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him no other, my soul is satisfied in him alone. To wonders here that I confess My worth and my unworthiness My value fixed, my ransom paid At the cross I rejoice in my Redeemer Greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. I rejoice in my Redeemer. Greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him no other, my soul is satisfied in him alone. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son, who drank the bitter cup reserved for me. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you, once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. The 
by your perfect sacrifice I've been brought near your enemy you've made your friend pouring out the riches of your glorious grace your mercy and your kindness know no end your blood has washed away my sin Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Lover of my soul, I want to live for you. Lover of my soul, I want to live for you. Lover of my soul, I want to live for you, lover of my soul, I want to live for you, your blood has washed away my sin, Jesus thank you, the Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. You may be seated. It's going to be handing out uh, an outline for this evening that I forgot to put out. Thank you, Pastor Matt, for doing so. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for the transition search committee. We ask your continued blessing on their work, and I thank you for their hearts and their desire to please you. And Lord, we, we look to you to uh, govern the, the future of this church as you continue to build this local church as a part of the larger body of Christ. Father, we do thank you for guests who have come our way. We, we, uh, we've enjoyed meeting them, speaking to them, uh, sometimes at length about their spiritual lives. And Father, you know them, and you know their need, some of them to be in church homes, some of them to be saved. Uh, Father, continue to use us in their lives. If that be your will, we pray. And Father, thank you for the builders of uh, Christ trip. Thank you for the success of it. We pray for North Stonington Bible Church that you would bless their future in this new uh, addition to their, to their campus. Lord, thank you now as we go to your word. May you use it in our lives. May we hear it believe what you're saying, understand what you're saying, give us help by your spirit, I pray. Help us to rejoice and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians. Uh, <clears throat> it is the last passage we were looking at this morning. Um, as Pastor Matt, a, a great introduction to this evening by reading uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He read a little bit before, and I'll allude to the context, but We'll start in verse 26 in just, a, in just a few minutes, but let me just introduce our time by saying, or by asking you the question, think about it in your mind. Historically, who is it that gets attention for more than 15 minutes of fame in the media? Historically, who is that? And, and I'll give you the answers, because I know you're thinking of it. It, it, it usually is the rich or the powerful or both. It usually is the famous. 
Uh, it, it, it could be the pretty, the handsome in entertainment, certainly. The world exalts all of those things. And, and what we find in this passage is that the way God works often runs contrary to man's ways. Now, it's not a fault to be pretty or handsome, that's, or even rich, if, if you are seeking the Lord. Uh, but God blatantly says that he, in this passage, that that's not what he looks at. And he often works and runs contrary to man's ways. He delights in exalting, as we saw this morning, the humble those whom the world would overlook. We saw it in Psalm 113, verses 7 and 8. Listen to it. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. Yes, that is uh, an allusion to Israel and how he dealt with them, but it is also his ways of doing things in the New Testament. Jesus, the Son of God, is the most striking example of this, I believe, of God lifting people up from meager circumstances. Think of the details of his birth. Now, his existence, obviously, glory in heaven, but the details of his birth, well, you might have chosen him to be born in Jerusalem with lots of fanfare, but no, a a place where they keep animals in Bethlehem. His mother was nothing out of the ordinary a simple maiden his father a carpenter not a bad trade but a meager trade think of who the first announcement was to you might have picked the chief priests but no it's to shepherds in a field Uh, we say lowly shepherds because on the the ladder of socio-economic popularity and status they were low the lowly shepherds. Isaiah documents Jesus' humility in chapter 53, 2 and 3. He grew up before him. Jesus grew up before God like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Jesus did not stand out above the, the crowd in any way. God did not choose that for him. So he's an example. David is an example of this. A young shepherd wasn't even brought in to be a part of Jesse's sons when Samuel came. No, he's out tending the flock, but he's brought in and he has chosen the youngest one. And this young shepherd slays the giant Goliath, God lifting up the meager, the weak, the poor, to do great things. Later I'll mention Gideon and how God whittled down his army and did great things with him. Jesus' disciples are examples of this because they are termed as unlearned, And we know they were fearful men at times, and especially after the arrest of Christ. But after the resurrection, we see a change. They courageously and publicly preach the gospel, God exalting them to the place of proclaiming his truth. And another great example of God exalting the humble is the makeup of the Lord's church, those he saves. And that's our passage here. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God but by his doing 
you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And we say from our hearts, I pray this evening, all praise to God. So we follow up Psalm 113 with a study of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 31. And you have the outline in front of you. It is human nature for each of us to think uh, <clears throat> well of ourselves and even at least tempted, if not <clears throat> caught up in the world's measure of success. But God, in essence, says to us in this passage, it doesn't matter how you measure up according to wealth, power, fame, nobility, or the political correctness of the day. Without my grace, he would say to us, you are nothing in my eyes, and because of my grace, you have the most valuable of all riches in Christ. And that's how our heart should respond, with those two truths. The context, I said I would allude to it, Paul is dealing with the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God, which is often mistaken by the unsaved as foolishness, but it is not. Consider God's calling, verse 26. For consider, the word means see it, think about it. Your calling, brethren, we'll talk about that. Brethren would be those born again. So it is a call to the church to consider God's calling. There is a general call of God that goes out to all through the preaching of the gospel. Jesus called people to repent and to believe. <clears throat> um, let's understand that the calling of God in verse 26 is that which opens the ears of the heart to receive the gospel message. That's how Paul is using it here. He's not talking about the general call of everyone to repent and believe. Consider your calling. It's more personal than that. It goes back to the day you repented and believed. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Paul said they were saints by calling. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then the immediate context, verse 23 we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block, to Gentiles, foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That is, to those where change takes place. Romans 8, just to go outside of 1 Corinthians and give you one other reference, in verse 29 and 30, familiar to you, so listen. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. These whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So God's calling, in this context, here's what it is. It is the act of God to awaken a spiritually dead person that he or she might repent and believe and be saved. Amen? Oh, that was weak. I don't call for it often. Listen to that again. The act of God to awaken a spiritually dead person. If you forget that, read Ephesians 2. Dead in our sins that he or she might repent and believe and be saved. God is telling us in verse 6, consider your calling. Think about it. That's a part of it. If you are saved, the wonderful, humbling, often misunderstood and even maligned truth is that he chose to save you. Verses 27 and 28, we read it a moment ago, but three times it is mentioned, God has chosen. God has chosen. God has chosen. You would not be saved apart from his effective work on your heart, his calling. As verse 30 says, 
by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. God's grace is more than, listen, this is so important and so uh, stirring to the soul to humble yourself and realize this. God's grace is more than providing a Savior. God's grace is more than giving you the opportunity to believe. God's grace is enabling you to believe. There's a lot of children who grow up with godly parents like I had who take their children to church that are unsaved today, that are my age. I, I, I remember some of them in the church, even the small church I grew up in. God's grace is enabling you, enabled you to believe. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Now listen, I admit this, this is a difficult truth because it challenges our understanding of fairness. Let's be honest about it. Let's talk about it honestly. How could God call some and not others? And I want to say to you, as I always have said through the years, God's not afraid of that question. We could go to Romans 9. We won't tonight, but he answers that question. And people have come up with different answers to that question, and some put labels on themselves and others. Calvinist, Arminian, Reformed, traditional. Let's be disciples, okay? Let's come and learn from following Christ in the Scripture. I encourage you to honor God by honestly, wherever your understanding is, honestly seeking to understand and believe what he has revealed in the scripture. And when you read, because you will, when you read in the Bible something that does not fit your understanding, make it fit your understanding. No. Allow allow scripture to shape and form your understanding. That's got to be our story of discipleship. And that leads us in this passage to appreciate the greatness of God's grace and salvation. So let's come back to verse 26. Consider, see, look at your calling. And the you is plural, church. Look at all those God has called in the local body, in the larger body. When God chose people for his family, Who does he choose? This is where Paul is leading us to consider. Consider what it's like. Who who does he choose? The answer is humbling. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. Now, we do need to notice the phrase not many because there are some. Some wise according to the flesh, but not many philosophers, intellectuals, some mighty, but not many people of power, some noble, but not many people of privileged birth. The truth here is that God doesn't normally, according to this passage, populate his church with the high and mighty, but with the ordinary people of society. And this was Jesus' example in the choice of his 12 disciples. Luke 10, 21, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. He's looking at his disciples and calling them infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. The Lord Jesus Christ praising God, considering the calling of the disciples we should praise along with him. That's the point of reading that passage. Now, I thank God there are exceptions, but thank God that one way he shows off his grace is to choose the ones that the high and mighty would pass over if they were choosing the team. What joy it is to consider our calling. All praise to God. Secondly, understand the reason for God's calling. Why does he do it this way? Verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. That is, to show the wise that their keen mind doesn't make them right with God. I had a 
good conversation with the owner of a, a, a record store in York. Always a good conversationalist. He's got a keen mind. And he, he kind of knows that, and he enjoys conversation. Not a believer, but we had a good conversation. But his, his keen mind has not made him right with God. So I pray for him. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. In other words, to show the strong that power over others doesn't make them right with God and never will. We don't gain heaven by power. And verse 28, the base, probably the emphasis here is low born, just not high on the status ladder. The base things of the world and the despised, those looked down on, hated by others even, like Matthew the tax collector. God has chosen the things that are not. In other words, insignificant people in the world's eyes so that he may nullify the things, are, the things that are. In other words, to show people of privilege that their earthly blessing doesn't make them right with God. Luke 16, 14 through 15. The Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him, Jesus, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. And so God will shame the wise. He will shame the things that are strong. He will nullify the things that are in the world's scheme. Now the church of Corinth must have included, Paul is writing to them, it must have included many people in these categories, foolish, at least they would have been thought that way, weak, base, people that are not. Common people of every variety, from mostly the middle and lower segments of society, maybe with a few wealthy and powerful people because of the not many, remember that, We're thankful for that. And I think God does the same thing today in the church, and in so de doing, he confounds the wise and the strong and the noble by turning their worldly values upside down. He nullifies, he shows as insignificant the mighty by using the weak. He nullifies the wise by using the simple. He nullifies the professional by using the blue-collar worker. And I'm not trying to categorize too much there, but just saying in a way you might think and understand it. Whatever status you have in the world's eyes disappears in the church. It's of no consequence to God and should be of no consequence to us. That's part of the application here. We should celebrate this. I mean, sometimes you, you hear it said, well, I know I have, so maybe you have too. Heard it said that we should pray for this or that rich or famous or powerful person to be saved because he or she could do so much good for the church. Well, we certainly should pray for all men. Yes, we are, we are commanded to do so in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. But the idea that God and the church needs the rich, the powerful, and the famous is a wrong way to think. It's not God's way. It's not what we celebrate in this passage. This passage shows us that what people often emphasize as so necessary is often set aside totally by God. God accomplishes his will through the foolish things, the weak things, the base things, the despised things. So be encouraged. Power and influence, whether you have it or not, they are not necessary to be greatly used of God. Now certainly we rejoice when anyone is saved. The angels do and we do. 
And yes, when rich and powerful people are converted, they can use their means to advance the kingdom of God and should do so. But they are saved the same way as everyone else, and the angels rejoice the same as for any of us. God values them no more or no less than the least among us. And God shows them that their usefulness does not derive from their position or their abilities, but rather from his presence in their lives. And then we come to the reason for God doing it this way. What is the reason for God's calling in this way? Verse 29, so that no man may boast before God. No one of us or any in the body of Christ at large can point to himself in any way and claim that, that something about themselves is why God took notice of them. The, the sovereign calling of God, if we understand that correctly in this passage, leaves us with nothing whatsoever within ourselves to boast of because God made us alive from the dead. There's not much we did in that dead condition. All praise to God. Finally, Paul leads us to celebrate the graciousness of God's calling. Verse 30. But by his doing, we read that phrase earlier in thinking about calling, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written let him who boasts boast in the Lord beginning in verse 30 note the phrase by his doing that is his choice his work his grace his mercy you are in Christ Jesus his saving work on the cross is credited to you and so you are in Christ Jesus the the work is credited to you the righteous life is credited to you your sin placed upon him paid for in full you're part of his body the church you are in Christ Jesus who became and by the way the tense of the verb there is meaning that this is God's work, not yours. You are in Christ Jesus who became God's work completely, became to us wisdom from God. That is an understanding. This is part of the awakening. This is part of being made alive. It, it comes to us. We understand that we need a Savior. We understand that we can't save ourselves. We understand that it's not a scale of good versus bad, it is a cross and Christ upon it, a sacrifice where God's wrath was satisfied, who became to us wisdom from God, an understanding of Jesus and how to be forgiven of sin, how to know God personally through him. And then I think aspects of this wisdom are described, aspects of our salvation, wisdom from God and righteousness, which is perfection in God's eyes because Jesus' sinless life is credited to us. Another word that would go along with this is justification that is full forgiveness of our sin. Righteousness and sanctification. We have been, there, there's really three parts to sanctification to remind you. We have been made holy by his death. We are being made holy as we grow by his grace. And we will be completely holy with glorified bodies when he returns. Sanctification. Wisdom from God. We understand righteousness. We, under righteousness, we understand sanctification. And redemption. Redemption is deliverance from the penalty of sin in this context, deliverance from the penalty of sin through the payment of that penalty. Redemption involves the idea of payment. Christ paid the debt 
for our sin. But it's more than simply the penalty of sin. It is deliverance from the power of sin. We are no longer dead in sin. Sin no longer has exclusive power over us. We can give in to the flesh, but we can also follow Jesus in obedience through the power of the Holy Spirit. So there is a part of redemption that is, I've been delivered from the power of sin. I'm not a slave to it anymore. Anymore, I do deal with my flesh, but I'm not a slave to sin. And deliverance from the presence of sin. We look forward to that. Being out of this body that does have a sin nature and having a new body that does not. Redemption completed. Look at verse 30 again. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I want you to notice just from that verse, everything we have is by God's doing. Everything we have is because of Christ's blessing, we could say. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus and Thus, we are blessed with these things. And everything you might lack in the world's eyes is not worth comparing to what we have from God in Christ. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Eternal things. Eternal things. Riches, popularity, beauty are very temporal. These are eternal blessings. Verse 31, so that purpose, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So we celebrate being in Christ. We celebrate possessing true wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, not because of something in us, but because of God's doing and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we say again, all praise to God, which is where we were led in Psalm 113. Consider God's calling, who he has chosen. Understand the reason for God's calling to show his grace and power. Celebrate the graciousness of God's calling. Humble praise some practical implications just things that that come to mind from this passage I hesitate to use the word self image but you know it is a real thing how we view ourselves the self image of a Christian uh, is not who he is in the world but who he is in Christ These are on your outline. Self-image of a Christian is not who he is in the world. I mean, that's not our standard. that's That's not what we're fighting to be a part of, fighting to climb up. It's who we are in Christ. And we can celebrate that because there's a fullness to it. Number two, whenever you talk about yourself, give credit where credit is due. This is a part of what Pastor Matt was speaking about this morning, to to declare. All praise to God. Credit, our our testimony about salvation, our witness about salvation, at least a part of it, or a good part of it, is testifying about the goodness of God to us, to forgive us. The peace that we have, the love of God that we know in our hearts, and the assurance and hope we have of future. I mean, others may scoff at it or may not think that that could ever be for them, but it is who we are and we should talk about it. I think Paul is leading us to that in verse 30. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. He's not say, he's not using the word boast here in a negative way. He's using it in a positive way that you are giving credit to God. And to do so. Uh, number three, practical or, or practice. I'm sorry, practice equal respect and acceptance of all whom God has called. There's a lot in that, but you know, there shouldn't be any place you wouldn't be willing to sit on a Sunday morning. 
I know it may not be the place you're normally sitting, but there shouldn't be any, let me say it a different way, there shouldn't be anybody that you wouldn't be glad to sit by, okay? Practice equal respect and acceptance of all whom God has called. Uh, yes, from this, from this list of who he calls, there might be some people who had a different background than you. Rejoice that God has called them. Equal respect and acceptance of all whom God has called. Number four, obviously stemming from that, never think yourself above others, and five goes along with it. Never think yourself beneath others in the church. I think this passage teaches us to, to, to see one another in light of God's calling. And, and therefore, uh, all are valuable. We're on an equal plane before the Lord wanting to honor him. There's not a socio, uh, social status. There's not a ladder of, that we're trying to, to climb in church. We serve in different ways according to our gifts. And there, there is a sense in which um, teachers are held to a higher accountability. There's certain things like that in Scripture. But no one is unimportant. No one is above another in Christ's eyes. That's my point. And number six, God's work through the church doesn't depend on individuals with money, power, or influence. God often does things in Gideon-like ways with scarce resources to show whose power is really at work. I think that is true. I think that's the example we see in Scripture often anyway. At least we see it with Gideon. We see other times where, where uh, God's people did nothing. He did it for them through angelic uh, work or, or just by his grace. It's not that we sit back and wait. No, I don't mean that, it's, but it's, it's that we don't have to have a certain amount of money to follow the Lord or think that we need power in the community or influence in the community in order to be his church here and to serve well. And then lastly, like Jesus, be a friend to sinners. We see this example not only in his choice of the disciples, but in how he interacted with individuals in his life. Pastor Matt, you read the, 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 his declaration of fulfilling the prophecy from Matthew, I believe it was, that, that he came to preach the good news to the poor. That's intentional. Good news to the poor. Uh, and I, I'm not saying we should look at that in a dollars and cents way. I, ju I just mean God is not a, a respecter of persons the way our world is. And so be a friend to sinners, to the foolish, to the weak, to the base, to the despised. Just as Paul has been inspired to write that this is who is populating the Lord's church. Any thoughts or questions? Let's pray. Father, help us to, to uh, in our heart of hearts right now, just boast in you, praise you personally for choosing us, for putting us in a position to hear and then giving us understanding and, and leading us to receive Jesus opening our hearts to understand and believe on him. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for my parents who put me in that position. But thank you for your grace that opened my heart to understand my need. We pray that for more and more. We've prayed for guests tonight, some of them. We pray that you would draw to Christ. We pray that for the children of our members. We pray that in our community, that you would use us in that way. That this passage, our celebration of our own salvation, would continue to burden us for souls around us. Help us to be a friend to sinners this week. In 
Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you. Keep you Wednesday night. I hope you come with food. I'm going to come with food. Lord willing. We'll see you then.